Mr. Smith, good to see you, sir. Dan, this is you, way back when. So uh, actually, Dan called me a couple months ago, and in pure Mark Fox fashion, I started putting this presentation together. I had planned to start last weekend, but then uh, Canton happened. So I started putting this together about Wednesday and Thursday, but uh, thanks to a lot of people behind me, we got a lot of great information. And this uh, title slide really kind of shows a little bit about the history altogether here in Fort Worth because right up in here, that is the first ledger that was recorded with the weather instrumentation here in uh, Fort Worth. And this is one of those things where I'll talk a little bit about Dallas because it is Dallas Fort Worth, but for the first uh, 20 years or so, it was just Fort Worth. And then the politicians got involved and well, they've remained involved. So way back when, no pictures, of course, or uh, very few pictures, actually. And then uh, this is the meteorologist in charge of uh, the office when it was uh, over in uh, Love Field, actually. And yes, that's a suit and tie out flying a kite and being paid for it by the National Weather Service or the U.S. Weather Bureau. So we actually still play with balloons, but uh, thankfully we don't have to dress up quite like that. And then all the way through, it became a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more, I will say, sophisticated because I'm going to show you some of the technology that was used way back when. And this is a picture from last weekend. Uh, this was from last Saturday night. This was about the time when we knew about two of the tornadoes over near Canton and uh, the killer tornadoes were just about to come along. So not only have we uh, come a long way with uh, just plain color, uh, quite a bit of technology improvements as well. So this is me. I've got the long title there. It's a title I got a few years ago in lieu of a pay raise. But uh, as uh, Leanna told you, well, my uh, background is actually being an Okie. North Central Oklahoma, you see a lot of tornadoes. I became a meteorologist on June 13th, 1975. Yes, I am that much of a geek that I remember exactly the date. I was nine years old, Stillwater, Oklahoma, an F3 tornado came through town that night. I was ticked off because their baseball game was canceled. I was mad. You could ask my mom that, but you'll have to wait for another life. Um, but what happened was the game got canceled, so we went back home. We lived on a hill in uh, north central Oklahoma. If you go to Colorado, they will laugh at that definition of a hill. But we watched the tornado come through. That is, my dad, my brother, and I, my mom and my sister were yelling at us from the house to get inside, but we're from Oklahoma, that's what people do. So I became a meteorologist pretty much at that point on. So I've been trying to uh, take a look at a lot of these things since then and really try to figure out what's going on. And before we get started, if you can't already tell that I work for the government, obviously I am dressed up exactly like the coat and tie, but uh, got a few disclaimers here. And some of these will uh, look familiar, some of them won't. I'm happy to take any kind of questions, but I really want to take uh, a few moments to, uh, to acknowledge a few people that I blatantly stole from. I mean, uh, that I'm using their information here. I did uh, take a few uh, images from all these people, especially the University of Texas Arlington Digital Archives, also uh, weather.net, basically uh, Fort Worth Star Telegram as well, and anybody else that I did not quite catch. They own these pictures, I do not. Obviously we'll be making this available to a few folks, but I uh, just want to make sure that uh, those people are acknowledged. Also Skip Ely, Bill Budding, Tom Bradshaw, those are the three people that I've worked for at this Weather Service office. Skip Ely, I worked with uh, during the uh, Fort Worth tornado back in 2000, pretty much at ground zero for that right now, and uh, worked for Bill Bunting during April 3rd when we had the tractor trailers flying through the air, and Tom Bradshaw has brought us all the, uh, the bad stuff ever since. And uh, of course, that usual last one, the, any opinions that I put out here, those are mine, it may not necessarily be those uh, associated with my employer. Now. At this point, I can say anything I want. That's good. So I'm going to be talking mainly about one office, but there's actually four offices of the National Weather Service here in, in the city of Fort Worth. Did you know that? Dan, you probably knew that. 
At least I hope Dan knew that because Dan uh, Smith used to work down at the uh, Southern Region, Southern Re National Weather Service Southern Region Headquarters down in the Federal Building, not too far from here. There's also a Center Weather Service Unit, which is located over off FAA Road, just to the south and west of the American Airlines Headquarters near DFW. That's where the air traffic control is. And there's the River Forecast Center and the National Weather Service Forecast Office, which are in a building out on Northern Cross Boulevard. There's a reason you have not driven past it. It was put out there in 1993 because it was way far away from anybody. And that is just south of Loop 820, just east of Interstate 35. In other words, where construction meets natural slowdown. So what I'm really going to be talking about is the Weather Service Forecast Office because that's what I'm most familiar with, although I did work for Region for about four years as a Regional Training Officer. So this is Dallas-Fort Worth. Just where exactly have we been keeping records since 1898? Well, it started out in downtown Fort Worth. In fact, the old post office, the first federal building in Fort Worth, Texas, and this, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this building, but if you take a look very closely, you can see the weather instrumentation right up here. So this is Texas. These are the federal government. So they, uh, the Weather Service at the time, the Signal Corps was actually up here in the attic. Windowless room, hard, well, windowless rooms. Can you imagine what it was like in that attic in July of 1898 or 9 or pretty much any time until the building uh, finally went down. So that was here from 1898 to 1934. 1934 we decided to move because there's a brand new facility still there, U.S. Post Office, so we moved literally two blocks. Time and expense was probably made uh, and people probably complained about it which they probably should because once again, everybody is up here on the roof taking weather instrumentation. So only lasted here for about three years because what happened in the 30s? Well, airlines started coming around, at least not necessarily airlines, but airports and aviation community started to get a little bit heavier and stronger. So we moved out to Fort Worth Meacham Field. We're there to about 1937 to about 1953. A little bit better, starting to get into a little bit more technology here. So we've got these flying things around. And finally, they put us somewhere other than the attic of a federal building. But you can still see right there on top of the roof, that's where the weather instrumentation is. So quite a bit of uh, strange things going on. 1953, there's another airport in town. And this one is out at Amon Carter Field, or more commonly known, Greater Southwest Airport. And at least at this point, they're not putting us way up in the attic or into a windowless room, not giving us the big dogs up here, but they're in a building off to the right just somewhere. And if you go out to this site today, it's actually very close to where DFW is now. In fact, where broadcast, uh, Channel 5 does their broadcast from, Avon Carter Boulevard, that essentially is the footprint of the old runway. And the runways were here, they're in red, and then the other runway was kind of coming through here. The terminal has now been uh, replaced by a Starbucks and a few other things. And all of this is pretty much down in here. So 1953 through 1974, also during this time, there was a meteorologist in charge who, if I were next to him, I would probably call him a pack rat. But that pack rat is a big reason that we're able to put a lot of this stuff together and get a lot of these old pictures. And of course, in 1974, what happened then? DFW Airport opens. What could be greater than a giant sprawling, oh wait, uh, massive concrete. So since 1974, we've been out here till about the mid to late 90s. We were doing manual observations, but now it's automatic and it's up in this little area right in through here. So it's not necessarily surrounded by a bunch of concrete. We do have a lot of grassy areas around and most of the development as far as the taxiways has been off to the west. One of the reasons is because of the weather instrumentation off to the east side of Dallas-Fort Worth. 
So until 1974, the official observation sites for the Dallas-Fort Worth area have been taken in Tarrant County. And since 1974, it's actually in Dallas County by about 300 feet. Close enough for me. So all of this has been really going around. So all of the weather instrumentation. So when your favorite meteorologist gets on the air and talks about those records back in 1898, 1902, there could be one of those four or five different sites. So, and that's where we're kind of keeping everything. So as things went along, a little bit about the Weather Service itself. Back uh, when the President Grant administration, well, that's when they developed the Signal Corps. And the Signal Corps is the U.S. Army at the time, mostly cavalry. They're the ones out there with the flags, showing everybody how uh, General Lee is moving that way and he's about to kick your ear in or whatever. So President Grant establishes the United States Signal Corps. It's under the War Department. So the beginnings of the National Weather Service are actually in the War Department. And this was the original charter to provide for meter, taking meteorological observations at the military stations in the interior, blah, 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 blah. Government ease has not changed since at least 1870. And in fact, it gets a little longer as time goes along. So in 1870, the real reason for the Weather Service was to take observations. If you'll notice, the word forecast is not in there. Now, there is a little bit about giving notice that just basically means, hey, it's cold over here. The rest of that forecast is up to you and everything else. So, a little bit more about the Weather Service. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all this. There's not a whole lot really for you to read because I know somebody in the back is going, I really can't understand all this. Don't worry about it. 1870, it starts. We're over here now. A lot of changes have been made. Some of the highlights. The uh, Weather Bureau was created in the Agricultural Department about 1890, and basically it was to give observations and a little bit of advance notice, mainly for farmers. And then in 1940, when the Weather Bureau at the time was moved to the Commerce Department, where we still are today. So the Commerce Department, we were put there because mainly due to aviation interests had a lot to do with the economy of the United States. In fact, the mission of the Weather Service now is twofold, it is to protect lives and properties by issuing forecasts and warnings for a protection of life and property and for the enhancement of the economy of the United States. Because if we have another Dust Bowl or another 1950s, it's gonna have a big time impact from farmers, from commerce, and that's why we're in the Department of Commerce to this day. So a lot of things have happened but one thing that really has not changed very much is the weather. And at least we've got very good records here in Fort Worth since about 1898 or so. The Signal Corps, before the, the, before the Weather Bureau was established, and really before we came to Fort Worth, was that's a weather map. Mr. Smith, I think this is your first one, right? So, so if you can tell, and if I'm not talking loud enough, let me know. You basically have a observation site around Muskogee. Of course, everybody thinks of Muskogee. Shreveport, Louisiana, or uh, New Orleans. The next one off to the north is Omaha. That's all you have. So how good is the forecast? Well, there it is. For the past 24 hours, basically this is an observation site. Here's the observed weather at this place. Anything west of the Rocky Mountains, no information. Then again, the United States was pretty much over here and out in California, but that was so far away, it was like, you guys figure it out on your own. So this is the forecast. This is not the forecast for Fort Worth. This is the forecast for the entire United States once a day, issued at seven o'clock in Washington. How great was communication back then? Hardly anybody. I, I don't think President Harrison was pulling up his iPhone to get the forecast at this point. 
So indications for New England, blah, blah, for Texas, all it says here is falling barometer followed in Texas by rain. That's it. So when's it going to hit you? What about a severe storm? That's all you got. And that was one of the reasons that uh, decided to put a few more stations out there. So the Fort Worth office was established September 1st, 1898. And contrary to my son's uh, thoughts, he's back there in the back, I was not here for this event, Patrick. <laughs> so one of the big reasons, I think, and this is my opinion, because I could not find anything dis uh, perfectly attributing this, there was a tornado in Sherman, Denton, and Gainesville, caused 78 fatalities in North Central Texas in uh, 1896. Lo and behold, two years later, which is still very fast for the federal government, we have a, uh, a Fort Worth office. And that office was right there where City Hall is now. This is a picture of the post office. This is one of the pictures I blatantly stole from UTA Digital Archives. Don't sue me, UTA. I really can't afford it. But this is the uh, observation site up here. This is St. Patrick's Cathedral here in downtown and a couple of the mansions out there uh, just off to the west of downtown, or to the south of downtown, rather. And one of the things that would do is this is pretty much how you got your forecast every single day. Notice these little spires. These little spires had flagpoles on them as well. So if it was expecting rain, you would have a certain color flag that would be flying. If it was going to be sunny and hot, you'd have a different color you would have something like that. That was the gist of the forecast way back when. Remember, this started with the Signal Corps, so flags, they thought that was the way to do things. Flags have been great for uh, 50 years, so why change anything? There's the first ledger sheet, all spelled out, and I still, even with trying, could not write that neatly if my life depended on it, but that's kind of how it was. So. We have the uh, Fort Worth office, mainly an observation office. And the observation office, though, well, the main thing is really to take observations. But after the Fort Worth office had been there for a few years, well, guess who got jealous? So the politicians got involved once again. So the politicians get involved, and there was a, a uh, observing office established over in Dallas in 1913. Looking through the data, I love how it talks about the old Cotton Exchange building and the new Cotton Exchange building that was built in 1926. So they were there for quite a while until transferred over into Love Field in 1940. Politicians definitely got involved once again because Dallas, even though Fort Worth had the observation office for years, Dallas was granted the first forecast office. And then after, well, the Depression wanted to consolidate a few things, and plus there was a lot of talk about poor forecasting of the early 30s cold snaps. And basically, because of that, at least that's the reasons that were given, they moved the forecast office back over to Meacham Field in Fort Worth. Or, in other words, the politicians got involved yet again. This is a trend that continues to the present day. Observation site still is there at Dallas Love Field. Up until the mid-90s, you had people doing things, and now it's automated sensors, but the record is still there. So, this is the Weather Bureau office, back in, as it was in the post office, uh, the second one. And this is basically an observation office. So everything is done manually. And with this, I'm going to need my uh, lovely assistant, my son Patrick. And I brought you some of the equipment. Sorry, dude. Okay. Should make you do this, Dan. See if you remember how to do it. All right, so what's the temperature in here? 70. 70. Both, t both readings? Yep. Teenage boys, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> 70 on both. All right, so we're going to saturate this.
Basically, this is an old sock. The relatively new sock because the one this was at. So I'm going to saturate this. Now swing that around, but don't break it. Once an hour, this is how observations were taken. See, this is the part where I'm just going to have him do this for like 30 minutes and see what happens. <laughs> see, right now he's too nice and say, when can I stop? If this were at home, he'd be letting me know what's going on. All right, take a look at it. Now read the temperature on both of them. Uh, this still 61, this one's still 70. All right, the, the dry bulb is still 70, and the other one says what? 61. 61. All right, swing it around, see if it goes down anymore. Remember slide rules? Sixty-one. Sixty. All right, swing it some more. This is fun. <laughs> At least he took his hat off for this. Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine. All right, that's close enough because about two more minutes of being filmed, and this will be a uh, it'd be a child abuse. All right, so I put the, the wheel there on 59. What was the temperature? 70. 70. So we went down 11 degrees, so I put the wheel there. Our dew point is right around 51 in here. Relative humidity is a little over 50%. Once an hour, manual observations, slide rules, if it's hailing, go outside. <laughs> if you got a tornado, well, the paperwork to get out of that is probably over there. Whatever was going on, rain, sleet, hail, you were expected to go outside and take that observation and then mark it down. And that was pretty much it. You'd mark it down, you'd put it out into a radio format, basically telegraph and it would go to everybody else in the country. So everything was done manually. This is the old barometer. This is also a barometer where they are checking. Basically, it just spins once a day, and there's continuous ink flow, and then another set of barometers over here. I love how this picture is posed, because this guy is pointing here, but he's looking here. It never happens with posed pictures, right? So, the forecasts actually did not mention temperature. Can you imagine that? I mean, you kind of knew in July it was going to be hot. Kind of knew in the spring it could be either way, but your forecast did not mention temperatures. In fact, here's a newspaper front page that I found. See the weather section? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see. It's down here somewhere, right there. And the weather, United States Weather Bureau, Fort Worth vicinity, fair and warmer Saturday, highest temperatures in the middle 80s. In this case, in 1944, they were actually putting one day worth of temperature forecast. Your weather on the fives or the five day forecast, not happening. Minimum precipitation this date. Oh, here's your sunrise sunset. And your forecast tomorrow, fair and warmer. That's all you got. And that was pretty much it. So, until 1950, the United States Weather Bureau was forbidden by policy, not necessarily by law, but you could not use the word tornado in a forecast because the prevailing opinion was at that time if you forecast a tornado you're going to panic the people. There's some evidence of this but there's a lot of evidence of okay thank you for letting me know now I'm gonna plan and prepare. So this was the the bulletin that came out on July 12, 1950 
that states that basically, okay, well, up until now, the press quotes, the Weather Bureau officials are saying tornadoes cannot be predicted, or the Weather Bureau does not make tornado forecasts, or we are not permitted to make tornado forecasts. This policy is no longer in effect. Full memo in three sentences, obviously it takes a full page to say it. But that's government for you. So as we go along, we have now forecasts of tornadoes. And that's why you hear forecasts of tornadoes or the tornado records are only since 1950. We have sporadic reports of tornadoes through newspapers and whatnot, but we only have good, accurate representations of where the tornadoes were since 1950. This is actually updated through uh, 19 or 2017 because we have an, inter an intern at the office that doesn't want to be an intern very longer. So they've been working on this very hard. I actually like that in, in somebody starting out. So the Fort Worth tornadoes, there they are. I don't have city on there because, you know, the intern's not that motivated yet, but they will be. And there's the downtown tornado and the second downtown tornado, same storm system that kind of came through. This is one that came way too close to my house on March 28th, I think it was. I don't know, Patrick slept all through it. And then all those tornadoes since 1950. So that's why when the TV guys and the weather service guys talk about tornado records since 1950, here's a reason why. We couldn't not talk about them until then. And a lot of things have changed since then. So if you're going to be issuing tornado forecasts and trying to show some skill, the first tornado forecast was in 1947, Tinker Air Force Base, and a lot of skill involved, but quite honestly, they got a little bit lucky. But at that point, started to realize, okay, maybe there's something that we can learn from all this. So the first, one of the first weather radars went up at Carswell, and there's the radar dish itself being pulled up, and then the dome on top of that. This radar moved around just a little bit, Meacham, Carswell, Stephenville, and then finally decommissioned. But the radar as it went up, this is probably the guys with titles in their name because they're standing around doing nothing. But the technology has changed, the storms have not. Now this is not from North Texas or Fort Worth, even though I did try to uh, take a look at that. Had I started when Dan Ashley asked me to start this, I, I might have found one. But here we've got a hook echo in a storm that was back in 1960. And there is a storm that was in Moore looks pretty much the same. The storms have not changed. Meteorology has not changed. The math has not changed very much. The computers have changed a lot. So this data and that data are still exactly the same. But the way that we look at these things comes back into play. So uh, looking around for my son Patrick back there, this thing up here, this is a clock. The hands move, it tells you the time. And this is a time sequence of a tornado up in Kansas for about 20 minutes or so. And you can see what we call the hook echo down here. A lot of ground clutter here, but once a minute we would see everything go through. And this is how we would take a look at the weather forecasts or the, the actual radar image from way back when. So this is one of the original radars up in Topeka, Kansas. In Fort Worth, the radar got upgraded in 1958. There's your upgrade. And the upgrade comes, now this is a WSR Weather Service Radar 57 because the original one was a WSR 1, number one, one of the first ones around, and then the radar gets upgraded. Now, Mr. Smith, how many reasons can you see here that this is a staged photograph? <laughs> we ought to point out, at least for Fort Worth, that the radar was not in Fort Worth. Right. Uh, at least for the longest time, it was down in Stephenville, and the forecast office here 
Yep. Didn't have access to the radar. You, other than just a facsimile machine. You're getting ahead of me a little bit. Change. Yeah. <laughs> For a big reason, which we'll talk about this. A couple of things I want you to notice about the, the newspaper clipping itself. I know it's kind of hard to read, so this is, this is one of 30. In the United States, one of 30 radars. And then it goes on, and then it says the U.S. radar operator is Harold Richardson, and they give the address. <laughs> Things have changed since 1958. Gave his home address. I, I am so glad they don't do that anymore. Because they quote me every now and then and be, yeah, we get enough crank callers. I can't imagine crank people phoning in. Now, the other reason that I know this is a stage photograph, number one, this is the MIC. So this is the guy in charge with a fi fancy title. And he's sitting there looking at absolutely nothing. And the other reason is you could not read most of these radars if the room was lit. You just couldn't see it. So the radar actually looked a lot like this. See it? Basically phosphorus. So the radar sweep would come around, you would see your little blip, and then it would go away. Make your tornado warning. When's it going to hit? But the good thing about these radars was you could actually control the sweep. And there's your storm. And this is why they are called echoes, because this is microwave energy going out. If it hits something, if it hits something, part of that energy is going to bounce right back. If it hits something big, a lot of energy is going to come back, much like right in there. This is how we looked at radar until about 1995. It's not that long ago, is it? At this point, they're uh, taking some of the scans and getting rid manually of some of the lower echoes. There they've stopped the sweep, and there you can see the storm once again. Can you imagine the 2000 tornado with this technology? At this point, now the radar beam is holding steady. Instead of going around like this, yeah, you got that one on video, great. Instead of going around like this, it's now going like this. And just by using the, the, the laws of physics, light travels at whatever, goes out that fast, fast, and you know how far it takes, and you can calculate the position. So the hail core in this case is right in through here, but blink and you miss it. So that is how we did radar for years and years and years. Very primitive radar technology, but a lot of big events. Another time where I've got to mention Dallas because, well, they definitely got hit by one. 1957, you can tell this is a very old picture because one of the headlines is Democrat wins Texas election. <laughs> Remember my disclaimer, right? Okay. But that wasn't it. 1947, big flood. 49, first mistake I've ever made, sorry. 1949. Uh, there's LaGrave Field. The, the, I had not seen this picture until this presentation. So the floods came through, and this is actually after the waters receded a little bit. On LaGrave Field, it had the roof. The roof got damaged because of the flood waters. I, I had no idea that that happened. So thanks. And then you got Farrington Field down here. Uh, it's just big time bad floods. Six dead, tanker trucks coming in, a lot of bad weather that happened, and all you had as a radar was those little blips in the back room. It had to be a dark room because otherwise you're not gonna see those little blips. So decided that 1960, April 3rd of 1964, Wichita Falls tornado, and then the Palm Sunday outbreak was pretty upsetting to a lot of people. Those are tornadoes, uh, the one on the right, the twins, are there in Indiana somewhere. 
I believe. But uh, in the Midwest, we had a lot of tornadoes. And at this point, they decided we really need to upgrade a lot of the equipment out there because we have these big, bad, killer tornadoes coming through and we're not necessarily seeing them on these little phosphorus blips coming through. So one of the things they decided was all this ground clutter wasn't really good to have in a big city. Well, there's some thought there. So they moved the radar from Carswell to Stephenville. That way, Dallas-Fort Worth would be outside of the ground clutter. So that means the weather forecast office, which remained here in Fort Worth, is not the ones actually manually looking at the storms. How did they get the radar information? From these two screens right there. Make a warning decision based on that. I don't know how they did it. And they did it well, especially for the time. And then the, rate, the computer systems got upgraded just a little bit. So the radar goes to Stephenville, and that radar stayed there until about 1994. But then there were some more big events. At this time, Wichita Falls was in the uh, Fort Worth forecast area. So the forecast office here in Fort Worth had a very good lead time, advanced notice on these tornadoes. Uh, part of the reason was Seymour, Vernon, and some other places had already gotten hit. So if you saw a storm on radar, the assumption was it was spinning like a top over there. It's going to continue to spin like a top. So Wichita Falls, also Wichita Falls there in the back as the storm is starting to, to, to fire up. This is what the radar operator was looking at. Now, remember though the forecast office was in Fort Worth, so they were only seeing from a screen. Can you imagine? That's all the forecast office was seeing, one of about three radars. Somewhere in there, and yeah, it's a bad picture. I didn't take this one, but supposedly there's a storm in there that's supposed to be big and bad and look like that. So a lot of interesting things going on. Then there was another big event. Dan, you're for, you, you can't answer this one, all right? Anybody see anything on that radar scope that really stands out as a big, bad, dangerous storm? What about that? That little thing produced Nineteen eighty five, Delta one ninety one. Now you can answer questions again, Dan. Thanks. Want to see what the radar loop li look like? Nineteen eighty five. This was about five twenty eight to six seventeen. The radar site itself was down in Stephenville, so just off to the northeast. This would be Dallas Fort Worth International. Dallas was okay that day, Fort Worth was okay that day. There was just a couple little showers just happened to be right there at the airport. And this one was another one of those big events. Palm Sunday was a huge event that made us rethink the way that we're talking about tornadoes, the way we're forecasting, the way we're warning. And this one was studied by Ted Fujita. If you've ever heard of the F scale or the, the enhanced Fujita scale, this is the guy studied the, the, this microburst, even taking the flight pass of a Learjet that came through right before the microburst hit. And the American Airlines that basically was coming down into the flight path saw the first plane crash, so they went back up. Pretty good decision. Unfortunately, Delta 191 was already in the, in the flight path, hit the ground, a lot of people died, unfortunately. So out of all of this, kind of rethought that ground clutter thing. Not only should the radar be close to the airports, we should probably have wind information in there as well. So this was one of those big events right here in Dallas-Fort Worth area that we needed the next red system. 
And then the next rad in Fort Worth was installed and tested in 1992, and it's still working to this day. It is the same shell. The entire thing has been rebuilt about five or six times because the computer instrumentation is all much different, but the basic theory is exactly the same as it is from 1930s radar technology. Send out microwave energy, if it hits something, it's gonna reflect some of that energy back. So Fort Worth then moved into its current location. We're off of uh, Beach Street and Northern Cross Boulevard, basically. We know our building can take about 80 mile per hour winds because that's how fast it went down the highway to get to us. It's actually four modular mobile homes put together with a pretty good shell. And we do have a safe room that's uh, rated for about an EF3, EF4. I don't want to test that, but then again, I don't want to test anything in an EF3 or EF4. So we move out there. Now we've got some great technology. This is how we looked at radar. This is the guys in charge, because they're standing there not doing anything, while the forecaster does the real work. Al Moeller right there is fairly well known as far as uh, severe storm forecasting. This is my, one of my predecessors, Jim Stefkiewicz, who was a warning coordination meteorologist, just now retired a couple of years, or about uh, actually last year, at the end of December. And then Skip Ely, he is the guy that was dumb enough to hire an, a former TV meteorologist to come work for him in, in Fort Worth. And this is uh, back of our office, pretty much the same stuff you saw at the top of the post office building back in 1898 pictures. And this shows you that our place is really only photogenic in the snow. So that's the only pictures I had of the outside of the building. But that next rad was tested early, and it was tested often. The, four, the uh, Wichita Falls tornado, F4 at the time, had very good lead time, mainly because of some additional storms to the west. This one, this was the first tornado of the day. And this one had about a 24 minute lead time on it, which in 1994 was thought to be nearly impossible. And this is what the radar now looked like. This was a printed copy, but this is what we were seeing in all levels of the storm and some of the dam damage destruction there in Town Square of Lancaster back in 1994. Of course, Lancaster gets hit again in 2012. Cinco de Mayo, 1995, better known as the Mayfest storm. It is still one of the most expensive damaging hailstorms in history. It's now number two as far as monetary damage in the state of Texas and the United States because of a hailstorm last year in San Antonio. And this is some of the, uh, the damage from the people and the places in Mayfest. And that storm continued to move across Dallas and produced 16 flash flood fatalities that night as well. So big time hail. We still talk about Mayfest every single year because, I mean, you've got that many people out there in early May, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> but having said that, the, the planners, the organizers, they have a great plan in place. And if we had any different weather than what we've got right now, which is beautiful, we talk to them about 35 times a day, just making sure everybody knows what's going on step by step. Then one of the days I was actually working at the weather service, I was that young intern that didn't want to be an intern very long, so I worked extra that day. My house, my beautiful little boy there in the back was sitting in the bathtub screaming his fool head off, about right in there. Of course, the Bank One building, Fort Worth Star-Telegram's famous picture there of the tornado coming through and then the damage all the way through, and we're pretty much at ground zero. But nowadays, that's what the radar look like. Not only do we have the reflectivity, but we have the winds. And the reds would be going away from the radar, the greens would be coming back toward. It does take a little bit of uh, training to figure out exactly what's going on, but there's some spin right there, co-located with the hook echo. And on this case, we had a good 15, 20 minutes worth of warning on the Fort Worth tornado as well. And then in 2012, upgraded the operations area just a little bit. And there's supercells going on in Arlington, 
Cannondale, Mansfield, and also Dallas at the same time. This was not a fun day. This was the uh, tornado. This is US 287, just south of 820, so it's heading down through Arlington back into the Mansfield area. So technology has changed just a little bit in the last 100 years, thankfully. And then 2015, December 26th, not only with the radar, but the satellites are getting better and better. Not only can we take the temperature from space, which we can only do starting in about 1960, that we can actually take a picture of the storms. Dry air to the west. And if you remember December 26, very hot and humid, cold fronts on its way. This is one of those famous days in Texas where you had tornado warnings here, you had winter storm warnings up in the northwest. And then of course the radar continues to get better and better, still in the same spot. The radar is now down here. It's Spinks, Spinks Airport, right on the Johnson and uh, Tarrant County line. And then you have the reflectivity on the left. You've got the Doppler winds on the right. And you've got people like me that spend a lot of time looking at this stuff and going over it and over it and over it because meteorologists in Texas are given three wonderful gifts. June, July, August. What's the forecast going to be for those three months? Doesn't matter, does it? So that way we can go back and we take a look at all this stuff and we try to figure out where we did well, what we did poorly, and unfortunately with meteorology you always have those cases where you think you can do a little bit better. And we do go back and take a look at this so we can archive all this stuff and call it up. I can call up the uh, Canton radar data on my iPad, something that was unheard of back in the 70s and even the early 90s when you had to send the film to Kansas City to get processed, they would send it back. So if you wanted to look at yesterday's radar data, you had to do that in about three months. Nowadays, I can look at late data from last hour in about 10 minutes. And I can call up a lot of stuff. And of course, this week. Some pictures I took from the field. Uh, this is outside of Canton. This is where a mobile home used to be. Car probably not parked there the day before. Remains of a house. But a lot of this comes in, we had a, an average of about 18 minutes of lead time on this, which doesn't sound like very much, but that's a lot of time for people to get the warning, to try to figure out what they're supposed to do, and all these improvements in technology and going from a purely observational standpoint to a more forecasting standpoint really tries to help us out as we head off into the future. Because nowadays, a lot of the automation has come in the observing. Now, I can make Patrick go once an hour outside and sling that thing around or set up a little cotton shelter where we can put a fan on, on there. Yeah, there's an easier way to do it. Sorry, dude. But uh, those have been automated somewhat. There's a lot of quality control that goes into that each and every day. And you learn to spot the bad observations very quickly. But what has not changed and what has changed a lot is the forecasts. This was back from the Final Four. Actually, this was from the uh, Super Bowl week, or as uh, we call it in the Weather Service, the, uh, the week that uh, Jerry Jones started to hate me. Some dork there. Giving a briefing to uh, multiple people in the Metroplex. In fact, these video briefings, this was in the, the city of Arlington. Jennifer Dunn is one of our forecasters and giving a briefing to, uh, I think it was 16 places at once. And it used to be just one guy reading it to a radio, and if you heard it, great. If not, great. But nowadays, it gets a little bit more. We actually go out to uh, the incident command sites with a lot of decision makers, try to give them the information about weather, which is pretty much straight up. Some more briefings and a lot of information going on. And remember those screens of radars that you had where you couldn't even control what you were looking at? Well, nowadays, with relatively simple technology, you can bring that radar just in on a laptop. In fact, I've got the software on the laptop we're using right now. So phone, 
in a command center talking directly to people. So the observations have been somewhat automated, but the forecasts remain a human thing and decision making remains nonlinear. Because most of the time we think you issue a tornado warning, what do people do? I told you what I did when I was nine. That hadn't changed. So what we're still trying to do with all this technology is to try to get people to do the right thing. So a lot of changes have come in in the last 100 years, and we've got another 100 years to go or so. And even though I work for the federal government, I went to the University of Oklahoma, and I'm a meteorologist, which in this state is pretty much known as the trifecta of liars. <laughs> but that is my real name, my real email address, and the real phone number. We've come a long way from the era of black and white and balloons in 1940, which uh, really through about 1970, that was the only place I found pictures of women was during the war years. And of course, uh, we've come a long way since then. Usually it was uh, somebody dressed exactly like this in the 50s, but we've come a long way to a lot of people in the operations building, a lot of people out there trying to figure out what's going on with the weather. And we've had a lot of technology upgrades, a lot of information upgrades, and yet there's still a lot more that we can learn and try to figure out what's going to happen with the weather as we go on. So with that, I say thank you, and I'm happy to take any kind of questions, and I'm happy to talk bad about the University of Oklahoma, if you can't tell from my shirt. So thank you very much.